where you have what is education, which you can tell it's education because young people are sitting down and old person standing up. That, that they're just, oh, education must be happening. It's sort of a, a messed up model of education. But, but that's what this is. I will try not to be too educational. Uh, I'm trying to do something like 15 minutes. I won't go over. I just have these all out notes. So uh, it's not like I've written this talk out. Because if I wrote it out, then I just mail it to you and have to read it. And if I rehearsed it, I'd be bored doing it. So, uh, so it's going to be different. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I've learned from my best teacher I ever had, who I hope is also the best teacher you ever had, which is my mother. Not that my mother is your teacher. Um, but that really, uh, I, when I think about we're over teachers, uh, I learned more from my mother than from anyone. And so I have, I read this talk some years ago, and I had 10 lessons. Now they're 12 or 13. Uh, the first one, she used to always say to me, which I pass on to you, don't worry about your grades and don't be the first one home from the party. I had an unusual mother. She never cared what kind of grades I got. It made no difference to her. Uh, she thought I should be not having fun. Uh, first one, don't, don't be the first one home from the party. The idea is life is supposed to be full of joy. I was just talking to a beautiful young 23-year-old woman who plays the piano. I played the piano for a jazz trio class with her. And she's beautiful and very talented, a better piano player than I am. And she was depressed. I said, God damn, how can you be so beautiful and talented to be depressed? And young. You know, and as they say, youth is wasted on the young. How can you be sad? Part of life is to be full of joy. Uh, and to be enthusiastic. We were talking, somebody was talking about enthusiasm. In my teaching evaluations, students would always write, Dr. Bo is so enthusiastic. I always wanted them to say, he's so effing brilliant. But they never did. They just always said, he's and I take that for granted. Of course you're alive. Why not be enthusiastic? Why not care about all sorts of things? And if you don't care about what you're doing, do something else. There are lots of other choices. If you can't get enthusiastic, every day should be full of joy and laughter. If you're not laughing every day, you're doing something wrong. Uh, I'm a person who likes to deal with pain by laughing at it. Some people like to cry. And I, can, I can understand that, but I'm not one of those. And the other ones, uh, don't worry about your grades. Uh, I did well in school. That's why I ended up getting a PhD. Though I only I got a PhD because it was how you avoided the Vietnam War. <laughs> That's why I got a PhD in English, because I had to go to graduate school. There was no choice, or I thought I was going to be drafted. Uh, so I ended up in academics. So I'm not really suited for it. But the idea of not worrying about your grades, what you should worry about is actually learning something. You can actually learn even in school. It's hard to believe. Uh, I remember once I took a, an exam in a Shakespeare class. And it was a two-hour exam, and I, one big essay question, I wrote the best thing I'd ever written in my life. I was just felt red hot, felt like I understood Shakespeare. I got the highest grade he'd ever given in the class. And I didn't, wasn't the grade I liked that much as the, as the confirmation that I really learned something. I really saw something, and he agreed. Uh, maybe that's one of the reasons I ended up studying Shakespeare, because I realized I saw something about this. But you can actually learn things in math and music and literature. Uh, Real skills, how to speak a language, how to write a poem, uh, and that aren't measured by your grades. Now, nobody cares what grades are. No one's ever going to care again. Uh, another lesson my mother had, don't be too clean. Uh, she, when she was young, her mother used to say, you can either practice the piano or clean your room. And she became a world class piano player. Now, she'd never clean her room. She just played the piano all the time. Uh, which I, I tend to uh, believe in that, not being too neat. People say cleanliness is next to godliness. I say messiness is next to goddessness. <laughs> the great goddess, the pig is sacred to the great goddess because she's fertile. Childbirth is a messy process. Artist studios are messy. Writing something is messy. It's chaotic. If I wrote this essay, I'd end up looking neat, but you have to go through all this chaos and mess. Science is messy. Fleming never would have discovered penicillin if he hadn't left his dishes out. <laughs> I got bold one on even whoa, I'm famous. I just got a bit of zillow. Um don't have chills of felt don't be don't wash your face too much. Bad for your skin. It's constant washing and, and washing junk. She also, I realize now she's reading this at dinner, she believed in early in life she told me that she heard a dirty joke, the punchline to which was not tonight, Josephine. But she couldn't remember the setup, and if I ever heard that joke to tell her. This was a license to tell my mother dirty jokes for the rest of my life that somehow she wanted to hear uh, uh, this joke, and she, she liked dirty jokes. I know some of you 
don't think, say, people will say, why are there sexual jokes? Sex isn't dirty. And I like to say, if you don't think sex is dirty, then you've never had sex with me. <laughs> <laughs> this is a joke. I, I did this, I, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this joke at a club, and afterwards a woman came up to me and said, what did you do? <laughs> I said, it's a joke, baby! <laughs> uh, but, uh, oh, yeah, I, I love jokes. I published a joke book. I'm working on another joke book. The, the death joke book. Uh, but, uh, what, uh, now that last year I had a physical with my doctor, and I just heard a joke about a physical, so at the end of my physical, I told the doctor, hey, doctor I, uh, I heard a joke about a physical. He said, really? I said, yeah. The guy goes to the doctor. The doctor says, you have to stop masturbating. The patient said, how come? The doctor says, so I can examine you. <laughs> the doctor looks at me without cracking a smile or writes something he's trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid to go back. <laughs> you're, not, you're, you're not supposed to tell doctors jokes, I guess. Uh, let's go. Oh, if my mother was a piano player, and she rarely listened to music, she had records. If you can listen to music or play music, play music. If you're going to look at paintings, do paintings. Be an artist at however level. I want to talk to the writer Raymond Carver, who advised me, instead of to be a writer, don't read big books of other people's, write small books of your own. Just do it. Uh, be an artist, don't just be somebody uh, who appreciates art. Uh, another one. Or whether something bad happens, at least there's a good story. This is part of the story. So many of the best story tell stories about terrible things that happen. Oh, my mother, when she was a teenager, she was a flapper. In 1617, she was born in 1911, so 1927. One summer she was dating a boy, Norman Kropovich. Very nice boy who gave her a ruby ring he'd stolen from his sister. And my daughter Amy now has it. Passed on the stolen ring, stolen from her brother's sister. Now, this was in St. Louis. There was no air conditioning. It was hotter than hell. Everyone had to leave their windows open at night. There came this criminal, this guy, who would sneak in the open windows at night, wearing nothing but his underwear, find where a woman was sleeping in bed, and tickle her feet until she'd wake up, and he'd be there his underwear tickling her feet. She'd scream, he'd run out the window. Pretty funny, pretty terrifying. Imagine you waking up some guy in his shorts uh, uh, tickling your feet. And this became known as the Feets Burger. And all we're saying was the papers would say, Feets Burger strikes again. All summer, because you had to keep your windows open, it was so hot. But you didn't want to wake up to this man in his underwear tickling your feet. At the end of the summer, they finally caught the Feets Burger, and it was my mother's boyfriend. My mother dated the Feets Burger. Uh, this is the sort of story I grew up hearing. And at the time, it was sort of painful because she was had quite a thing for Norman Grumovich. She was in love with Norman Grumovich. Uh, but he was the Pittsburgh who went off, off to get help for the prison or something. But this story that was painful at the time uh, became amusing. Oh, my ex brother in law, Bryce, he had a story. He was in the middle of a camping trip. He went out on a big lake with a boat. Went out in the middle of the lake. The boat sprang a leak and he sunk immediately. He has to swim all the way back. He's very muscular, doesn't float. He swims for like an hour. He's still 400 yards from shore. He decides, I'm just going to die. I can't swim anymore. He settles down and comes up here. He walks the rest of the way home. Uh, <laughs> that, that was painful at the time. Uh, but it became a, 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 a humorous, fun story. Uh, as I said in my introduction, she laugh every day. Garrison Keillor said one of my favorite lines, that God is a humorist when he's working to a slow audience. There's all, all sorts of things that are painful now when you look back and you're funny, and you're the butt of the joke, and then you take it so seriously now. Uh, one of the best, uh, another person who I say, like, if you have problems, just wait and look different problems next year. <laughs> they might be worse, but they'll be different. Problems change, so if you can't stand these problems, don't worry. Just hang in there, suffer with it, and you'll have a whole new set of problems to think about. Uh, one of my models for uh, laughter is uh, Alice in Wonderland. I love Charles Dodson and Alice. Charles Dodson was a lecturer, as I am. I'm a lecturer, not a professor, a different class, as it was then at Oxford, to a, a lower academic class, teach more, make less money by and large. I'm happy having been a lecturer. But Dodson was in this world where Alice was the dean's daughter. It would be sort of like me dating the dean's daughter. The dean wouldn't approve 
and they didn't approve of, of his, his infatuation with young, young Alice. But he, he dealt with being an academic by laughing at it. And Alice wondered this all world where the, the Red Queen is mad, that everyone's crazy. And if you go out in the world, you find people in positions of power are mad as hackers. I won't mention any administrators in specific. <laughs> uh, but there are people, you, in any large institution, you, you run into people who've gotten ahead who are totally loony. And all you can do, I think, is to laugh. Uh, how I, I had a, uh, oh God, I, I was director of composition once, and English, chair of English, had gone a little senile. And talking was like talking to a duck. He'd say, I'm like, oh, 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 oh. I say, yes, sir, right on. You know, and then I'd do whatever the hell I wanted. Because what else could I do? I couldn't tell him he sounded like a duck. Um, <laughs> Oh, the kid, best place for conversations is the kitchen table. My idea of a lecture, or even writing, is to get a kitchen table voice. Students often, when they write papers, I don't know how they end up being so boring on the people when they're so interesting person. I know if I sat next to you on a car ride, you'd say interesting things, but when you write a paper, it's suddenly, oh, my philosophy of life is that. And you suddenly sound like you're 128 years old, you know, talking about the point and what I learned from this experience. Nobody ever learns anything from any experience. That's obvious to me already. You just go, go you know, maybe you learn something along, but not like that. Oh, I learned never to tell a lie. I learned this, that. People always puff up themselves to sound important. Now, the academics are famous for all the right papers to make their ideas sound really smart. Uh, uh, the main thing you want to be is conversational as well as dramatic in public. Public speaking, storytelling. You want to show emotion, as I've, some of you have taken storytelling with me. And the main trick is to have them show emotion, which means actually have feelings. Uh, my favorite quote from Shakespeare is at the end of King Lear. Uh, speak, uh, uh, speak, uh, speak what you feel, not what you're meant to say. Speak what we feel, not what we're meant to say. And the secret is one, know what you feel, and two, be able to articulate, which helps being a poet. How, how do you actually express your feelings and worry about saying saying what your feelings are? Uh, oh, it's, oh, another one my mother said. When uh, money goes out the door, love goes out the window. She, uh, although she basically raised all the kids to be artists, she played the piano. She always taught me, you have to take, take the money in your pocket. And, and so my history is, oh, I say yes to everything. I'm doing a lecture like this, but I'm not paid, but I just always say yes to anything. I never go looking for work by and large. I'm, I'm writing a little article on sisters from a book that somebody emailed me and asked me to. So, okay. Uh, I like the idea of saying yes, Jim. It's a nice attitude towards, have, to, uh, towards life. My mother said that if I, if I, if I were a woman, I'd be constantly pregnant. I wouldn't say no. <laughs> and I think it was one of her actual quotes. You know, she told me. <laughs> uh, my saint and mother. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is one I like a lot. You should make children happy whenever and wherever you can. Uh, I'm the sort of person who at a party will play with the children rather than talk to the adults. Not out of virtue, but because little children are more interesting than adults. <laughs> adults will sit there and argue about politics. Is there anything more horrible than that? No one's ever changed anyone's mind. But they like to sit and argue about a good open discussion. Republicans, Democrats, oh, please, anything but that. Uh, this way, the way of talking is arguing drives me crazy. I don't know how to argue. I can't argue. I can say what I say and you say what you say. I'd rather play on the floor with a little child. I was, I was telling before starting here, I was at a, my two-year-old granddaughter's birthday party. And there were about 15 little kids and about 30 adults. I remember trying with an eight-year-old boy to see how many times we could bounce a ball back and forth off, off of each other's heads. I don't remember a word I said to any of them. But, but I remember really enjoying, we got to four. I remember really enjoying, we got, we got, okay, we got four, life is good. Uh, and my mother was great playing with children. The secret, of course, with little children is you get on the floor. If you don't go, you can't play with, play with a child by sitting up there when they're down here. You immediately get down on their level and grovel in the dirt. Or look at leaves and bugs. And, uh, every day I show my two-year-old daughter my worms. I grow worms for my compost. So we always go up and look at the worms and take out the worms and count the ten worms. She's learning to count the counting worms. Uh, let's see. You can't give children too much love. 
My mother always said I was from the Harry Truman style of child rearing. Find out what they want and give it to them. <laughs> which I sort of believe. I you know my daughters aren't quite as much as that. They'll say, no, you can't do that now. We're going, ah, yes, you want ice cream at 10 on the clock? Have ice cream. You can do whatever you want. I'm, I'm a bad grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like as a father, whatever the children want. So that, the main thing is to be happy. It isn't that you're trying to develop yourself so you get into Harvard or UC Davis or something like that. The point is to enjoy life now when you're 2 and 5 and 7 and 9 and 14 and 22 and 38, etc. That life is joy. Who knows how you're going to live, how long you're going to live. So why not enjoy it all the time and make sure little children actually enjoy their lives? Which is hard. Just do what they want. And play. Some people don't know how to play with children. Uh, uh, how can you lose that? Part, it's part of being an artist, the idea of playing. Whatever, just messing around. Uh, let's see. Oh, whatever. My mother used to always often say, uh, when I, I was conflicted, I have to, I'd call her up, I have this exam tomorrow, but I want to go hear this music. My mother would say, would always say, go do it, you can sleep when you're old. It's always there, you can sleep when you're old. No, I can not let you sleep, I think that's, you know. When you're young, when, when you got into do everything. Uh, why hold back? You can fit it all in. Do everything. Don't say, I can't do this, I can't do that. I feel that way about uh, writing and other creative projects. I had a teacher in college, Henry Steele Collinger, who said, the secret of getting a lot done is to, instead of trying to do two things, try to do 14. And then you can get eight of them done. If you're only trying to get two things done, the most you can get done is two. But you have 27 projects. And I often do. One of them eventually will get done. I finally finished that. I, fi I finally did that. That I have all sorts of projects in all sorts of ways. In, in all the various arts, I have projects. Uh, uh, I take on more and do it all. Uh, yeah, you have all the time in the world to do it. Uh, oh, let's see. My mother, we moved all the time when I was a child. My father was an encyclopedia salesman, working way up from door to door to children. Uh, and so we'd move, and we'd be in a new town. I wouldn't know anyone, so I'd go shopping with my, with, with, uh, with my mother at the grocery store. And my mother always embarrassed me because she'd end up getting in conversation with strangers who would ask her advice. Often young women would say, my boyfriend, my husband, yada, yada, he's, he's a bastard, yada, yada. And my mother wouldn't have the California wisdom to say, how do you feel about that? She would say, dump him. <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, she felt you could change your life. <coughs> and, and there's a great book of home that ends change your life. Or look at that One can change your life up to the last minute. My mother changed her life. She was married to not my father, a jazz drummer, uh, who uh, had had two children. Who are my brother, step brother, and step sister, but my brother and sister and very close to them. That was the depression. Her jazz drummer husband couldn't get work, but my mother was a great piano player, so she played in a speakeasy. She was playing the piano. One night a guy from World War I came in, but she was told later, had a steel plate in his head and wasn't supposed to drink. He had a few drinks and started a big bar fight. Have you ever been around a big bar fight? I, I, was, I was out of place in the bar. I hid under the table. I was not in the fight. <laughs> I, was, I was at this bar in this huge bar fight. It was frightening. Chairs being broken. People. So my mother is a huge fight. She hides under the bar. Under the bar, she meets this man with his hat in his hand. He pulled down a bottle from the bottom of the bar and said, like a drink? <laughs> Next thing you know, she'd left her husband and taken her two kids and married this man, who was my father. <laughs> uh, so I have to applaud. Uh, I wouldn't be here. Um, if, uh, and her first husband wasn't very good, from what I understand. We never talked about it much of a divorce. It was sort of scandalous to be divorced in 1930. She was Catholic, so being divorced meant she was excommunicated, which meant I was raised without going to any church. It was a certain benefit. Um, I, I, I consider myself religious, but I, uh, I, I, I never was a church goer. Uh, why she married the drummer? And dear grandma said, because I was a shit. I said, ha ha, grandma. What a, <laughs> what a way of talking. Uh, I, I, I was my mother's favorite. Not right, but then she had favorites. But uh, uh, once my, the same niece asked my mother, Well, my name is Dobby. When I was brought home from the hospital, my sister Karen thought I was a doll baby. Couldn't say doll baby. So it came up Dobby. 
And ever since then, people who know me well call me Dobby. My wife calls me Dobby. The checks come to John. I'm Dobby's. Uh, uh, what was I saying? Uh, I was saying something over here. Uh, oh, my, oh, yeah, uh, oh, being my mother's favorite. My, 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 uh, uh, my, my niece Christine asked, uh, who's your favorite? Because my mother had five kids, three with my father and two with her first husband. I said, who's your favorite? And she said, oh, Dobby, of course. And Christine said, Mom, Grandma, you can't have favorites. And my mother said, God bless her, have you met the others? <laughs> <laughs> I like telling them because, uh, because I love my mother. If she lived, she ended up coming up to live, live with me. We planned it would, would make my siblings jealous of telling like that, too. Uh, yeah, yeah, mom, mom, if she hadn't died unexpectedly. Uh, you can change her, so she changed her life. She divorced, and then she told my father, she dated my father, left her first husband, told him she wouldn't marry him unless he had $250 in the bank. He finally said he had $250 in the bank, and they got married, and he admitted he actually owed $250. He had the number right. Uh, he just had the, had the sign wrong, it was a plus minus problem. It's a classic math problem. You get that right, he just had that the sign wrong. Uh, and, uh, but they had a happy marriage. We only recently discovered that people change their life. My niece, my uh, one sister's daughter and one sister's son, went to St. Louis to do genealogical research for my family. My parents were both from St. Louis. And there they discovered, in 1931 or something like that, my father had been arrested for embezzlement and did a year in prison. We never knew this, but dad was an ex-con. <laughs> Not many of your other teachers have parents who were ex-cons. Uh, he was working for a charitable organization and embezzled a thousand dollars. It was nearly twenty thousand dollars today. They arrested him. It was a front page of the paper. They arrested him on the street of St. Louis and asked him what, what happened to the money. And he said, I spent it on wine, women, and song. And then he did a year in prison, got out, never told anyone. Never told my mother. My mother told me everything she had told me. And this was the days you could, there was no Google. You just never told anyone he'd been in prison. <laughs> okay. He went on and became an encyclopedia salesman and worked his way up to be chairman of the board and, and have, have, have a great success. So he too changed his life. Although maybe being an investor in prison for investment is not that different from being chairman of the board of a large corporation. <laughs> I hope it is different. I hope it is more honorable. But one can't really be sure. Uh, oh, another thing. Let's see. Uh, oh, change your life. This is what I like. Uh, Socrates near the end of his life. Uh, he's in prison, about to eat hemlock and die. He has a dream in which he's told he should make music. And so he starts learning to play the flute. I love that. That's all Socrates needed was to play the flute. So, because he shut up the goddamn talking all the time that Socrates does. The question, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? The Socratic method, I hate the Socratic method. Interrogation, interrogation. Can you imagine being Socrates' wife? No wonder Xantippe was famous as the Sheridan or Shrew. Because Socrates would be impossible to live with. And at the end of his life, he finally rises up to play the flute. You don't have to deal with language. There are other ways to communicate than in words. You don't have to argue all the time and figure things out. Music is a different language. Oh, that's one of the things I learned from my mother, too, that music is a different language. Uh, she played the piano every day of her life. She never played in speakeasies again. My father was afraid of what would happen then. She never drank. Uh, she saw what happened when she had a drink. She ended up being her first husband. But she played in every synagogue and church and dancing school and, and this and that. Uh, I, I play the piano to myself, and I started changing. Now that uh, I, I spend about 20 hours a week now playing the piano, I play the piano my whole life. But I'm playing in a trio, and actually studying it. I travel with my music with me, so in spare time I can study and figure out what I'm doing in my afternoons. And it's really I'm spending most of my life now on uh, worrying about music, uh, which I quite which is a big change for me because I can make money as a writer and as a performer. I can't make money as a piano player. There are too many better piano players. But like Socrates, I think that's what I want to do. With all I want to do is make music. It's a different kind of language. There are these different ways of thinking. There's thinking in words, which when Einstein heard people talk in words, he laughed his tail. He thought that was the funniest damn thing that people thought they could make in words. He thought viscerally with his body, at the speed of light, <laughs> and, 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 and thought in terms of numbers. 
I understand mathematical thinking. I, uh, I like I like mathematics a lot. Thinking in words. I also do. Thinking in words means one thing. It means thinking using metaphors. This is universally agreed upon that, that you compare something with something else. My point of view. That's a metaphor. You understand something means you stand under something, and it's hard to understand under a weighty idea. It's hard, hard to understand. All, every sentence you ever use is a metaphor and how you, you take what you know in your body there and apply it outside. Okay, I know what a rose is like. So I say, love, my love is a rose. Or I know what a toilet is like. I say, love is a toilet. And that's a different way. Uh, but it's, like we try to understand something abstract like love by using metaphors. This is all of what thinking uh, in, in words is. And this is what all students should realize. A language is a very, very limited tool. And what you're doing when you write is using metaphors. Also, in science, you use metaphors. You think the Bohr atom was real? No, it's a metaphor. Now quarks are metaphors. Uh, he's a thousand years from now, we'll have different metaphors of way, way of explaining these things. Oh, for 10,000 years, we've had the very popular metaphor that the whole universe is like a growing thing, it's like a plant. That life is like a tree. This is, it still hasn't broken down. Or in the 50s, they started talking about physics that uh, uh, things are uh, uh, things at the sub subatomic level are events. That's a metaphor. We use a word like event to understand things. Uh, uh, space is curved in the present sense. It's something like curved. That's a metaphor. It's curved space idea. What do you mean by that? But you're trying to express something that's inexpressible, and in language you have to use metaphors. One of the things I learned from my mother was using metaphors. What was a the power of, of different ways of thinking uh, that you can think through music. And I think through math mathematics, I've always loved mathematics. I'm not so good with this physical thinking, thinking with my body. Uh, but she was a great storyteller and great with language and to understand how language works. Let's see. Oh, another uh, thing I learned from my mother was the importance of dreams. Not all dreams, but every so often you have a really big dream. My mother went up when we were poor in Detroit, and then, uh, uh, she had a dream one day about a horse winning a race. I can't remember, I'll make up a name for the horse. Velvet gown, or whatever. She came down at breakfast, told my father, I had a dream about a race horse. My father was a lifelong gambler, he owned racehorses. He wasn't, I like to say, my father was a alcoholic, a womanizer, and a compulsive gambler, but he had his bad side. <laughs> his bad side was being emotionally distant, especially to his daughters. And those are his sins of desire for life. Gambling is a great thing to do, too much because you have to have contempt for money. People can't gamble and people don't care about money too much. So you're not willing to bet $50 on this. My father had great contempt for money, so, uh, which is a good attitude to have, not to care. That's one of the good things I got from my father. So my mother said, I had this dream about the sports, Velvet Gun. My father goes, gets a newspaper, sees that day track in Detroit. There's a horse named Velvet Gown right He goes down, bets $20 on it, wins $200, comes home, shows my mother the money. My mother is totally angry. How dare you, you know, gamble away to hardly afford meals. They couldn't get me out of the hospital because my father wanted a contest selling encyclopedias and they didn't have enough money to pay and sneak up the freight elevator to visit me in the hospital. We didn't have any money then. She said, how can you dare gamble away money that we need? Yeah. Two weeks later, she has another dream of a racehorse. <laughs> oh, what, what's your way name? This uh, uh, fiery baton. Uh, she tells my father, now, John, you promise you're not going to bet that I have another dream of a racehorse. I can't bet I have to go to Indianapolis today for a sales meeting. I don't, can't go to the racetrack. I said, well, I've dreamed this horse, fiery baton, won, won, won a race. So my father went to the meeting, and as Albany ended up in a bar, and in the back of the bar, there was a bookmaker. He looks up, finds somewhere in the country the horse named Fiery Baton running. He bets $100, wins $500. <laughs> he comes home with the money. My mother is totally outraged. Says, I'll never tell you a dream again. And she never did, but she might have had it. It was her unconscious actually supporting this game. Because her unconscious was, was picking the winners. But she didn't want him to do it, so she wasn't going gonna to tell him anymore. Uh, and that was sort of an example. She, she had a dream life. That's, I've had some big dreams. My, my most recent, I'll tell you a couple of dreams if I love talking about dreams. My most recent uh, big dream, 
Uh, I discovered, as maybe you've discovered, that this world we live in is a prison. It is, obviously. We're all trapped in this prison, and the guards don't want us to know it's a prison. So they pretend we have freedom, but actually we're all locked in this world. And I realized this in my dream, I thought, God damn it, I'm going to break up with my family, my three daughters, my wife and I. And I, through great cleverness and daring, broke us out of the prison, into freedom, and then after a day or so, I realized this was just still part of the prison. You can think you break out, they'll let you think you break out, and you're still going to be in the prison. Totally depressed, I walked to the back of the prison, looked out the window, and there was this two-story, old-fashioned 19th century house. And a woman in a white dress came up and was sweeping the upstairs porch. And I looked at her and realized she was Emily Dickinson. Oh. And she said, hello. And I introduced myself. She said, yes, I'm Emily Dickinson. Nice to meet you. Oh, you're my neighbor. I'll we'll talk later. I'm busy now, but nice to meet you again. So she went down, and I woke up feeling wonderful. Maybe we all live in a prison, but at least Emily Dickinson is my back neighbor. <laughs> and so life, life isn't so bad, which is sort of about how <coughs> There's poetry in life. Uh, Emma Nick is the one that lived this very limited life, saw very limited people. <coughs> who wrote the poems on the backs of Island Globes. There's a recent facsimile edition of her poems, and we can see how she wrote it. <coughs> but even if we live in a prison, there's such a thing as poetry. Uh, <coughs> oh, another dream. Uh, and what? Shakespeare does his message. You, you should remember your dreams. A lot of dreams are trivial. These don't make any sense. But if you remember that every so often you have a big dream, like a horse. I, I had a horse race winner once. Uh, uh, Zabu went to the races and won money on the horse and bought an alto saxophone for $200 in my profits, which I still have. I would have been able to afford an alto saxophone. Uh, so you should remember your dreams. Shakespeare always emphasizes this, the importance of actual dreams of the characters. The characters don't pay attention to their dreams come to no good, as Romeo comes to no good. He dreams that uh, uh, he died and Juliet comes and wakes him, wakes him up with many kisses. And right after telling us that dream, he goes to find Juliet dead. Instead of kissing her and kissing her and waking her up, he kills himself. Schmuck. You know, uh, uh, <laughs> he, uh, listen to your dreams. Uh, well, listen to the dream. Uh, the smartest person in the world used to be, she's dead now, Marie Louis van Franz. She was a young, Carl Jung's assistant, uh, lover of Wolfgang Pauli, the physicist. Uh, world's expert on fairy tales, wrote the best book on number, on number and time, the mythology of numbers. I just thought she, and as far as interpreting dreams, interpreting stories, uh, she was the smartest person in the world. And shortly before she died, she came to me and told me the secret of luck. Which I've told some of you this all, all already, but the secret of luck is to concentrate the heart. Now, you all know what it means to concentrate the head, except when you do it university. The problem is knowing what it means to concentrate your heart. And if you concentrate your heart, you'll get lucky. And I want to use the phrase, get lucky, that's, that's a euphemism for getting laid, right? Hey, you get lucky? Yeah. Uh, 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 rhymes always has, have this hidden meaning in English. Breath, death, life, wife, luck. But well, I won't go on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a real reason for these rhymes. And if you can learn what it means to concentrate your heart, I really do believe you'll be lucky. Uh, and that's just as important as learning to concentrate the head, your head. Learning how to do calculus and linear algebra and, uh, and all those useful things which I'm all for. Uh, but one of the, uh, you, the way you concentrate the heart in poetry is learn it by heart rather than analyze it. Learn how to say poems. Uh, my mother knew a million songs by heart, so I love learning songs by heart. I play a song without music. That's so hard for me to, to learn to do that, so I'm not reading the damn note because the music's not on the paper. The music's in your mind or, or out there. Uh, so we're all, okay, let me do a poem. Uh, the owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. The owl looked up to the stars above and sang to a small guitar, Oh beautiful pussy, oh pussy my love, what a beautiful pussy you are, you are, you are. What a beautiful pussy you are. Pussy said to the owl, the elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Too long we have tarried, oh let us be married, but what shall we do for a ring? So they sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the balm tree grows, and there in a wood a piggywig stood with a ring at the end of his nose, his nose, his nose, with a ring at the end of his nose. Dear pig, are you willing to sell for your one shilling? Your ring said the piggy, I will. So they hurried away and were married next day by the turkey who lives on the hill. 
They dined on mince and slices of quince, which they ate with a runcible spoon. And hand in hand, by the edge of the sand, they danced to the light of the moon, the moon, the moon. They danced to the light of the moon. I typed, I published articles on poetry and studied poetry and graduate book in PhD in English, but I much prefer knowing a poem by heart than analyzing a John Donne sonnet. You'd be able to say it, and it's good. And it's, it's always a miracle because I didn't practice that. I just, it's like starting a song, you know, dee da dee da dee, dee da dee da dee, and I can do the rest of it. And you just trust the rest is going to come. I just start from the owl and the pussycat, and yes. Uh, and with anything like learning songs, once you learn one by heart, you learn more by heart. It gets easy to learn things by heart. Once I, I was in line to ask Carl Jung a question, a psychologist. I'm very influenced by Carl Jung and Shakespeare and my sister Margaret and people who influenced me and my mother and Trump. And everyone got to ask you a question, except I got cut off before my turn. And I only got to ask, hear the question the old lady in front of me asked. And she asked Jung, how do you know when you achieve your true self? And Jung said, you, you know you've achieved your true self when your eyes get all, you, when your skin gets all crinkly and your eyes get all twinkly and you realize that everything's a mistake. <laughs> I've, I've done it. Everything's just a little off. Mistakes are made. I think uh, the, the tempered piano is an example of that, because to, to play in all these keys, we can keep the piano slightly out of tune, uh, is it, the whole point of temper, tempering the scale. Uh, you, you discover things, science is based on mistakes, messing things up, how, how, you've got to mess up uh, to get something creative. Uh, one more. Uh, I was 21, 22 years old, just in graduate school, visiting my parents in the East Coast. One night I woke up and had a dream where the angel of life appeared to me. In fiery white, he told me the three secrets of the universe. Or else it was the angel of the universe who revealed the three secrets of life. I couldn't remember. And I wonder why I was told the three secrets of the universe. I went to sleep when I woke up, I only remember one. Which was, when the earth shatters, the atmosphere survives. I didn't know what that meant. But later that week, I was at the Jersey Shore with my brother and his family. We were swimming, I'm a fairly strong swimmer, and I got further out than anyone else. My brother went in, I was out halfway the waves were breaking. And the waves started coming up faster and faster, pouring over me, hitting me harder and harder. I decided I better get back in. I start swimming, and I get a riptide that pulls me back out, and the wave washes over me. And I'm starting to panic, I wave the shore, and my brother in the shore waves back. <laughs> Now I'm screaming, help, 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 nobody can hear me. <clears throat> I'm swimming like crazy. Finally, a big wave wipes me out, and I think I'm going to die. And I just can hardly, hardly get a breath, and I hear a voice inside me, very calm, as I'm screaming, coughing, sputtering. This voice inside me says, well, I'll have to be going now. And I think it was my eternal soul. It was abandoning the ship like a rat. <laughs> Uh, abandoning this body that's treated it well over the years, but it was, it wasn't much worried at all. Part of me was not worried as I panicked. It was going, and with that, I was sort of unconscious. I was washed on top of the waves until a lifeguard saw me and came out and rescued me. And then, of course, you do when you almost die, you deny I can die. It's so embarrassing. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> you know, so he, he helped me and, uh, and got me together. And I reflected back on this was the dream. Uh, uh, when my body shatters, in the ocean when I drown, part of me that uh, survives. The atmosphere is the air, is the spirit. When earth shatters, the spirit survives. Uh, this I didn't find very consoling because uh, I felt like I didn't want to die, that my soul wasn't being very friendly to me, it was a little cold. It was, well, it was no big deal, I'm leaving you, I don't care. I can't. So what I did in response was not become more religious or spiritual than some people might. I took skin diving lessons. To be good in the ocean, so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't try it. Drown and became a, a, a very proficient uh, skin diver. Uh, but to speak, I'll, I'll, I'll end with well, well, uh, two, two, two little things that I'll end. Uh, the, uh, the spirit surviving. I, I'm sure people survive after death for a little while. I'm not sure for how long. They survive eternally would be a nice dream. When my mother died, died unexpectedly after minor surgery in the recovery room. We were all upset, my wife, my daughter, and my daughter, Lily. Lily and I were hungry, my wife didn't want to eat. We went off and got a pizza or something, came back, it was dark. Every house in the street had electricity, but the electricity had gone off in our house. So our house was totally dark. We went upstairs, 
It was Sunday night, the night she usually called. We sat in a candle in the bed in the dark, sort of crying, nothing to do. When the phone rang, when the phone rang, I picked it up and all the lights went on. And I thought that was my mother calling to say goodbye. That's why all, all, all the lights went on. Uh, and I was sure that was her who just died who always called on Sunday, and that's why the lights went on. It's one of these synchronous, uh, magical events. Uh, but I've never seen her again. I've come back since, except in dreams. It's such a consolation with the dead to see them in dreams. It's like they're alive again. A few years ago, when my mother and father were moving into an apartment, I felt really good for that. They've been dead for years. Uh, there is something very reassuring. When they show up in dreams, it's like they're still alive. It's like there's a kind of eternity. Uh, and I'd like to end with uh, following the last piece of advice my mother always gave me. Whenever I left the house, she'd say to me, Dobby, keep your big mouth shut. <laughs> because I got in trouble talking back to teachers and generally being a wise guy. Uh, and she was trying to tell me to keep my big mouth shut, which I often failed to do. So now I will shut my big mouth and thank you very much.